So, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 18 and 19, my subject is God the righteous judge. <clears throat> to focus our hearts and to understand the basis of what's going on in the text, I'm going to read chapter 18, verses 10 through 21 as our beginning focal text. So I invite you to stand, please, as I read the word of the Lord. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Then the men set out from there, and they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. Let's pray. Lord, we ask now that you would lead us into all truth, that you would reveal our hearts and speak to our minds and do the work that only you can do by the power of the Spirit. I say with this text that nothing is impossible with God. So do your saving work, we plead and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The message to Abraham and to us in Genesis 18 and 19 is grace and truth. God's grace and the promise of a son is clear truth as it relates to the destruction of Sodom. That's the message of Christianity, grace and truth. Truth about sin and the Savior who has come to set us free from our sin and God's grace toward all who trust in Christ. We begin in chapter 18 and we see that the Lord God appears to Abraham. The Lord appears to him in the middle of the day. Abraham's taking a break, a siesta, if you will, in his tent. And what you have here is what's called a theophany, an appearance of the Lord in a specific time and place, most often in a human form. He appears with two others with him. The consistent understanding of who these two others are are angels because of chapter 19, verse 1, which continues the narrative and says, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. There are those who interpret this text to say that the, the three people are an allusion to the Trinity. I am not convinced by such an interpretation. Abraham responds to these visitors with reverence and hospitality. He has a meal prepared and he stands with them as they eat. As this unfolds, we see that God has come, that he has appeared to Abraham, one concerning the promise to Abraham and Sarah of the son and the other concerning the destruction of Sodom. Let's first see how the Lord clarifies that Sarah will have a son. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Now let me take you all the way back to chapter 11. In chapter 11, when Abraham is introduced, we're told that Sarah is barren. In other words, during the childbearing phase of her life, she was unable to have children. Now we know something entirely different about Sarah. The way of women had ceased to be with her. That means she's post-menopause. So, humanly speaking, it is now impossible 
for Sarah to have a baby. So, verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, before you're too hard on Sarah for her laughter, I just want you to notice it's not a scornful laugh. She's not arrogant and unbelief. It's a laugh that says, this is hard to believe. It's hard to believe. I'm an old woman. I'm I'm past the, the bearing of children. But what God is doing here is teaching Abraham and Sarah that his promised seed is going to be the result of his direct work. Isaac is going to be the result of a miracle in the womb of Sarah. Now think about this. This is pointing you ahead. That God is going to do a miraculous work in the womb of Mary. And just like the question comes to Sarah, is anything too hard for the Lord? The angel says to Mary, for nothing is impossible with God. I further want you to think this at this moment. Every Christian in this room is the result of the miracle work of God. When the disciples asked Jesus, who then can be saved? His response in Mark chapter 10, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. That God alone can save. And God is doing his saving work here through the womb of Sarah. He says, at the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. Now, God's been promising this now for 25 years. Now he puts a timetable. Within the course of a year, he will return. And Sarah will have given birth to a son. We'll deal with that in depth next week at the birth of Isaac. I do want you to notice verse 15 before we move to Sodom, though. It says, but Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Now, technically, Sarah didn't laugh out loud. If you look at it very closely, she laughed to herself. It was in her head. And I just want to warn you today, what's in your head, God knows. There's nothing hidden from him. Now the second reason for the theophany becomes obvious. The Lord now reveals his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. This passage is most frequently used and treated for an emphasis on intercession or prayer. What I want you to see today is that the predominant theme of this section is justice. Verse 16. Then the men set out from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Now the Lord reemphasizes his covenant with Abraham. Seeing, verse 18, that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. So God has promised that his covenant with Abraham is going to be kept and he's going to see to that. We'll see that again in chapter 20, how God makes sure that this happens. But he says as a result of the covenant, Abraham and his children will keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. The evidence of God's covenant will be in them and through them. So friends, here's what you need to see that the exact opposite is happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. The way of the Lord is not being kept. They are not doing righteousness. They are not upholding justice. Verse 20, the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So like the blood of Abel, crying from the ground, the injustice and the heinous sin of Sodom is crying out for justice. The outcry against their grievous sin was so great that the Lord now goes down to see if it was this bad. 
The cry of Sodom speaks of evil, but the response of the Lord will be righteous. The Lord announces that he will go down and to see if it is actually this bad. The point is that the Lord's judgment is based on full and accurate information. Brothers and sisters, we live in a moral universe. People think they can do what they want and get away with it. And they may escape human justice. People do it all the time. But no one, no one will escape the justice of God. They have done all together, he says. Literally, that means completeness. It means they deserve destruction. Their sin is full or complete, and as a result, judgment is going to fall. So God here is depicted as holding back and making sure that the crimes committed have reached such a point to where destruction is inevitable. So, as you think about the world around you, and you think about this text, and you lay them side by side, brothers and sisters, I make this statement with great confidence. The Lord's judgment of the wicked will be just. Now, Abraham doesn't see this yet. As a result, he intercedes for Sodom. He says, so the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still, still stood before the Lord. Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? So here's, here's the assumption. You've got to get this. Abraham's assumption is, that there are multiple righteous people in Sodom. So God, how can you destroy it if there are righteous people there? Suppose, he says, verse 24, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked so that the righteous fares the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of the earth do what is just? You know what the answer to that question is? Yes, the judge of the earth will do what is just. The Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in this city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Now, lest you think Abraham's being cocky, look at verse 27. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. He recognizes who he's talking to and the limited nature of his mind and heart. But this prayer that he offers is based on the fact that God is righteous. Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked, he asks. So in this contrast, or in these negotiations, you see the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. So who are the righteous? The answer is those who have joined the Lord by faith who follow his standards in obedience. Those are the righteous. That's Abraham. He's believed, it's credited into righteousness. And, and God says he will live as righteous. Those who have no part of the covenant and those who do wicked things or do not obey the Lord, those are considered the wicked people. The Psalms talk about the wicked who are destined for judgment and the righteous who are destined for peace with God. Now Abraham is concerned that the righteous are going to suffer the same fate as the wicked. Now friends, here's what we can be confident in today. We can be confident that the righteous judge of the earth will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. One of the things I was reading this week, one of the things you can trust and hope in, the world's not going to be destroyed completely in a nuclear holocaust. You know why? Because you're here. God's not going to allow his people to be caught up with the wicked. He promises that he will take care of his people. Now, friends, do you realize that those of you who are in Christ how important you are to the United States right now? That you are part of what holds back the judgment of God? That the presence of the wicked require God to deal with us accordingly? 
Now, this request with, with, between Abraham and the Lord God gets down to 10 people. And God says, if there are 10 people there, I won't destroy it. Now, it's apparent that at the beginning, Abraham's appealing for justice. When he gets down to the 10, he's just appealing to, to the grace of God. And ultimately, God is going to protect the righteous, but there are less than 10. And as a result, God destroys Sodom. And what I want you to see is that the Lord God justly destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. In chapter 19, verse 1, the two angels come into the Sodom in the evening and they find Lot sitting in the gate of Sodom. That means Lot is a man of influence and importance. He's connected. He's taken a place of high responsibility. He is the one sitting at the gate. He persuades these two angels to come home with him for food and lodging instead of staying in the town square. So once they come into his home, we clearly now see the actual wickedness of Sodom. Now remember this. These two angels have gone there to see what's going on and to carry out the judgment of God. Now watch what happens to them. Verse 4. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all of the people to the last man surrounded the house. Now, I want to make sure you understand verse 4. That's not hyperbole. So a hyperbole would be, say there's a big offense in Gastonia today, and we say all of Gastonia turned out. Now, we don't mean each and every person from Gastonia turned out at this big event. We just mean a lot of people. This means every man. Every last man in Sodom ends up outside the door. Young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house and they called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them to us that we may know them. These men, all of them, want to either participate in a homosexual act with these men or watch. All of them. This is a wicked group of people. Lot begins to negotiate with them. He goes out and he begs them, in verse 7, brothers, do not act so wickedly. Then he makes this incredible, I, I can't even grasp this offer. I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and you do as they please. Only do nothing to these men for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now catch what happens here. Young people don't miss this. You're so judgmental. You've come here, you outsider, you believer. You've just come here to judge us. You've just come here to get in our way. By the way, there's much, much being written right now friends, that the persecution of Christians in the United States is going to center around the sexual freedom that's being had in America. That we are being seen and we're going to be seen as a barrier to people's sexual freedom. And that is where the persecution will come from. He says, they say to him now, now we will deal with you worse than with them. That means they're about to ravage Lot right there in the front of his home. And here's what happens. The angels reach out of the door. They grab Lot and pull him into the house. And then they strike these men blind. Now, think about this with me. You come to do something wicked and evil, and suddenly you're stricken blind and everybody else with you. I think I'd go home. Now, folks, this, this ought to give you chills. This is how wicked these people are. It says they wore themselves out groping for the door. They are intent on doing what they came to do, even if they can't see. Now we see the Lord's grace toward Lot and his family. In verse 12, it says, The men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons and daughters-in-laws, or anyone that have in the city 
bring them out in the place for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord and the Lord has sent to destroy it. So Lot went up and said to his son-in-laws who were to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. I'm gonna tell you what's happened to me in the last 10 years. I saw it the first time in Europe. I was preaching in Europe to a group of room of young people who laughed at me. In the last 10 years, I've been laughed at repeatedly standing before young people preaching. Happens here on a regular basis. It's sort of happened this morning in this service. People teeheeing and chuckling, chuckling at what you say. That we're living in some kind of delusional world, these Christian people are, and they're just judgmental and crazy, and that's how his sons in law saw him. But it says in verse 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Then verse 16 says, But he lingered. Does that mean Lot's indecisive? Does that mean Lot wants to stay? Does that mean Lot loves Sodom? I don't fully know. He lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. And you better underline this in your Bible. Here's the gospel, friend. The Lord being merciful to him. That means Lot didn't deserve it. God would have been right to just left him there as he lingered. But the Lord was merciful and he brought him out and he set him outside the city. Now once they're out, there's some interchange between them. They're told not to look back. And then we see in verse 24, the Lord's justice for Sodom and Gomorrah. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Now, if you ever get in a liberal class, well, this was just a volcano. That's not what it says. The text says the Lord rained from the Lord of heaven. The Lord brought the sulfur and the fire and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the habits of the city and what grew on the ground. And I want you to remember something. Let me bring you back. Why did Lot choose this area? Because when he looked down, he saw what was like the Garden of Eden. And if you go to this valley today, it is destruction. It's dead. It's where the Dead Sea is. There's nothing there. Verse 26, but Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And this example shows up in the New Testament, obviously comparing to what Jesus said. Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. She's longing for what is back there. And as a result, the judgment of God falls on her. She's within arm's length of safety. And those who are escaping and she looks back and the judgment falls and she's turned into a pillar of salt. Then verse 27 says, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord and looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Now I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Jude. It's the last little tiny, it's one or two pages in your Bible, right before the book of Revelation. So that's the last book in your Bible. Find Revelation, flip the page back from Revelation 1, you'll find Jude. There are multiple references in the New Testament to Sodom and Gomorrah, and all of them are sobering, all of them. I'm just going to show you a few. Jude, verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire... That means homosexuality. Serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now just turn back a couple pages to your left to 2 Peter. If you get to Hebrews, you went too far. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. So Sodom and Gomorrah, clearly, the Bible's saying here, is an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. Let me finish up 
Genesis. It says in verse 29 of chapter 19, so it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had given him. So we clearly here see the grace of God, that God, for the sake of his covenant and for his name, saves Abraham and Lot. Then chapter 19 ends on this sad, heinous note as the daughters of Lot, who convinced they'll never have a husband because everybody they know has been destroyed, get their father drunk and then go in with him and become pregnant on successive nights. As a result, they give birth to two groups of people who continually battle the people of God. One of them are called the Moabites. But even in the Moabites, we see the grace of God. In the very lineage of Jesus is a woman. You know what her name is? Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite whom God extends grace toward. And God is gracious to the nations just as he promised. Now, all this text bears and, and must bear to us an application. We must apply this to our hearts. Now, <clears throat> I meant to say this earlier. Kids, after services like this, sometimes parents will come up and say, my kid wants to know if you're mad. Listen, children, if you were about to run out in front of a car, your parents would raise their voice. Not because they're mad, because they love you. And men and women, if my voice goes up, it is because I love you. I am not your judge. I was walking publicly about two weeks ago and on the back of a young woman's arm who was dressed in a manner to where she was communicating something about herself, tattooed on the back of her arm is, God is my judge. To which I said out loud, she did not turn around. I said, honey, if you only knew. If you only knew. We can throw that statement out to get you to back off of me so I can do what I want to do. But here's the truth, friend. The Lord God will righteously judge the unrighteous. He will. It's not that he might, he will. He will righteously judge them. In Matthew chapter 11 is found what I believe to be the most sobering text as it relates to Sodom and Gomorrah for the Bible Belt. It says, then when he began to denounce these cities, most of his, or most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable in the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. For those of you who have grown up in this part of the world, or let me just say in the West, to where Christianity has been accessible and available and you've come under the sound of it, let me just remind you that God here is saying they're gonna be a more stringent judgment. Not that Sodom's gonna get out of judgment. God's saying there's gonna be a more stringent judgment brought to bear on those who were in the presence of the gospel, who both saw and heard and then walked away. Here's what some of you assume, and you scare me. I'm scared for you. You assume as long as you get close to this stuff, you're in. There are people in this room right now, I don't know who you are, but there are people in this room right now that live like a total pagan all week except for church. Some of you are hungover sitting here right now. Some of you did some things last night that you don't even need to mention. But you think if you're close, you're in. My question to you is, how'd that work for Lot's wife?
We assume things. I'm going to tell you what we're assuming. We're assuming the grace of God. And Romans chapter 2 verse 4 speaks to it. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? In other words, friends, this is what this is saying. God's not destroyed you because God's kind toward you. Here's God's kindness toward you today that you are hearing this truth clearly explained to you. That's God's kindness. Now, you, you can play the modern game, God, and go, that preacher, he's, I just don't like him. I'm going to a positive church next Sunday. Go ahead. You're free. But you hear what I'm going to say next. There are going to be people who are cast into outer darkness who sat under positive preaching their whole life. We better hear the truth and we better heed the truth. We better hear what God is saying here, verse 5, because of your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Now, I don't have time to unpack all this, but let me just focus right here on self-seeking. So were the most self-seeking people in the Bible, the Sodomites, the people from Gomorrah? If, you, if you're going to take the Bible in whole and you're going to look for who the scripture would describe as the most self-seeking people in the Bible, you know who you're going to find? The Pharisees. Religious people. Self-seeking people. One of the reasons the gospel's not going forth in this part of the country is because self-seeking people are running churches. And as a result of that, as a result of that, people do not obey the truth. Then we've come up with a whole new category. We call them backslidden. Now let me just grossly describe backslidden. These are people who at one point accepted Jesus who now live like a total pagan. You know what you are if you live like a total pagan? You want me to tell you what you are? You're a pagan. You say, well, I believe once saved, always saved. So do I. But I believe that people who are saved live for Christ. I don't mean perfect. I believe that's clearly what the Bible's teaching. Folks, you can't claim something about yourself if something else is true. God promises here that those who do not obey the truth, there will be, there will be wrath and fury. Now, if that's all there was, now, if that's all you hear, go home mad. Just be ticked off furious just go on home mad but i encourage you to hear the next thing i'm gonna say because christianity is grace and truth it's not just truth it's grace and truth and here's the grace of god that jesus christ the promised son both satisfies the justice of god and justifies those who have faith in him romans chapter 2 gives way to romans chapter 3 and in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, the scripture says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, you're not going to get to heaven any other way. to whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This is to show God's righteousness because of in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness in the present time, at the present time, so that he might be just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, friends, track with me here. The word propitiation is a Bible word. It means that Christ has satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. You see, God is just. He is righteous. God didn't just go, it's all right, just forget it. Some of you think that. You think that's what Jesus means. And God just went, you know what, it's all right. No, it is not all right. My sin is not all right. Your sin is not all right. It demands the justice of God. And Jesus Christ came and he lived a sinless life and on the cross, he became sin. That means my sin, your sin had to be punished. Now don't miss this sentence. Jesus Christ took the wrath and fury of God on your behalf. How can it be? That only means something to people who understand their sin before God. God took it for us. Remember last week, there's only one reason one person walks between the sacrifice. It's because he would be the sacrifice. God would take it. Now, there's a partial understanding going on in this room. There's a lot of people that Jesus has glorified fire insurance. He's just keeping you out of hell. You're not going to live in a state of limbo forever, friend. There's two places of eternity for men and women. It's heaven or hell. Now, here's the deal. Only the righteous get into heaven. So if all Jesus did was keep you out of hell, where are you going? And if all he did is keep you out of hell, you're not prepared to go to heaven. You know why? Because you're not what? That's why the rest of the verse says Jesus is also the justifier. That means that the righteousness of Jesus Christ to all who believe has been applied to you. So now that to him who is able to keep you from stumbling will present you in his presence blameless. Blameless. That we who are in Christ will stand in the presence of holy God in the righteousness of Christ now and forevermore. So I say to you, look to Christ and believe. Quit looking back. Death is over your shoulder. Life is in front of you and it is in Christ. And friend, I remind you that when you trust in Christ, it has radical effect on your life. It affects how you live in the midst of Sodom. And that's the point of the growth group this week. It's to talk about how God makes not only us positionally righteous, but practically righteous. That we live as unto Christ in the world in which we are. I hope you notice something distinct about this sermon. Some of you felt this, even though this is not what I do. I could have got up here and railed on and on about Sodom. I could have railed about how bad it is and how horrible it is and how wicked and sinful people are. And I could have used... 40 examples, and you'd all went, that's not us. That's not what I did. I dare say every person in this room had a pause while I was preaching. You should have. But then joy. That Christ alone saves. Hear me, brothers and sisters. This world does not need to know what you're against. This world needs to know who you're for. Just because you're against immorality is not going to make an immoral world moral. 
They're not going to come over to your side and join you in morality. What people need is the saving power of Jesus Christ applied to their life. People need the gospel. And that's why we're here. That's why we're still here. That's why God didn't just take us out the moment we're saved. We are here to share his good news, his good covenant in the world in which we live. Now, we're going to sing a song. Come, you sinners. Chad could not have picked a better song to communicate what I've preached. This is an old hymn that speaks to the truth of what God has done in saving us. So I say to you, come you sinners. Come to Jesus. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there are going to be pastors here who could pray with you while we're singing. I'll be in the lobby to talk afterward. Or if you're, not, if you're afraid to do all that, please email me this week. Start a conversation where we can talk about what it means to be a follower of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I think of, I think of the sermons that I've read over the course of this nation. And my mind goes to Jonathan Edwards right now. He preached in Northampton and he called men and women to understand that their lives hung in the balance. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Oh God, I plead on behalf of men and women whom you're speaking to that they would repent of their sin and be saved today. And I pray for those whom you have saved that they would not presume upon the grace of God, that with joy, that they would come now and worship before you. Pray that we would come, that we would come as sinners in need of a Savior, as we would come as sinners who've been redeemed, and that we would rejoice in Christ, who alone can save. We thank you for your saving work and power. We pray this in Jesus' name.